Welcome pals to a new video. Today we are covering 2D player movement in Unity. This marks the first of a series of tutorials that I'll be giving in Unity for basics in game development, including modules for specific concepts and also templates for your own games. Before we start, a couple of prerequisites. The first is that you have some understanding of the Unity engine and getting set up in the engine. I'm using Unity 2022.3 in this video, but you should be able to use any version and also some comprehension on C Sharp. So just understanding at the very least what a variable is, what a function is and what classes are. Now, there are many ways to do many of the things in this video and there's no one right answer. It really just depends on the kind of game that you want to make. So what I'll be doing is showing you from the most basic version to the most complex version as we go through the video. Feel free to drop off whenever it makes sense for you or watch on if you're looking to familiarize yourself with more advanced techniques. Here, I've got an empty Unity project in 2022.3. The first thing we wanna do is create a game object for our player. We can do this by clicking up here and pressing create empty. We can also create a new game object by right clicking the hierarchy and pressing create empty. Let's rename this one player. I like to make sure that my objects are at 000, zero to start, it's just so that we know where they are. And if you press W, after clicking on the player, you should be able to see the position that the player is at. Right now, we don't have a sprite or a collider or a rigid body, so we're going to add those three as well. Underneath the player object, let's create some child objects. The first will be called sprite, and the second we'll call collider. On the player object, let's create a rigid body 2D. Unity has more than one physics implementation, one for 2D and one for 3D. For this series, we'll be using exclusively 2D variants of these components. So in this case, rigid body 2D is what we want. For now, let's set the gravity scale to zero so that our character doesn't fall off the screen. In order to react to things in the scene, the rigid body component needs a collider. That is the physical representation of what the body is. So let's go into our collider game object and create a box collider 2D. The box collider 2D by default will give you a size of one by one in-game unit. We can click this and see that it is the same size as our grid. When we run the game, this Collider's bounding box will not be visible by default. And typically you wouldn't want to use gizmos to actually run your game's graphics anyway. So let's give our character some visuals with a sprite. Type in sprite renderer and grab that. For now, we can simply add a square by typing square in the search and clicking the first object. This will be a one by one square, which is coincidentally the same size as our collider. So we're good for now. Your player object will now react to physical things in the scene. You can test this by taking your player object, copying it and pressing play. If this happens, everything's working well. If we take one of the player objects and move it around, the other should react physically. Nice. You'll notice that as we do this, the character rotates on these collisions. If you want to disable this behavior, you can do that by going to constraints and pressing freeze rotation on the Z axis. Now your objects will no longer rotate. So far, we've only been able to move our characters around in the scene view. Let's give them a script to make them controllable with the keyboard. On your root player game object, let's add a component that we'll create from scratch here called player movement. Your only option here should be new script. So click that. Make sure to remove any white space in the title and press create and add. Using that menu will create your script in the assets folder. What I like to do is create a folder called player character. Move our player movement into that. Double click your script to open it in your editor. I'm using Visual Studio Code, but you can use whatever you like here. I like to format my documents with curly braces on the same line. So that may be a bit different to yours, but don't worry, it'll function the same way. The first thing we want to do is give ourselves access to the rigid body that's on this game object in the inspector. You can do this pretty easily by declaring that object as public rigid body 2D, and then we'll call it body. Once you've compiled your script and returned to the editor, you'll notice that there is a body field in the player movement script. You can simply drag this into the field and that'll give you access. There are multiple ways to set this up, but I've done it this way because it's the most explicit. It means that you know what things are referenced in your script. If you're big on encapsulation and security in your code, you can make this private by removing the public and instead use serialize field. This does the same thing. However, the object won't be accessible to outside scripts without a getter or a setter. And alternatively, if you're very lazy and you don't want to plug things in in the inspector, you can also say body equals 
get component rigid body 2D. And this will tell Unity to basically search through the game object for a component that matches the type that you specified. Personally, I do this as little as possible. It's just not a particularly responsible way of doing it. And especially if you're writing this inside of an update function, you're going to be searching through the hierarchy every single frame. If done at scale, this could actually affect the performance of your game. So try not to rely on get component if you don't have to. Luckily, we don't because we dragged it in the inspector. Now that we've got a rigid body, let's go ahead and make it move. The first thing we want to do is set body.velocity to a new vector2. And just to test to make sure we can actually get this going, we can set the velocity to 1 on the x-axis. This will basically make our body move 1 meter per second for as long as the game is updating. There you go. We've got some motion. Now let's make it so that it only updates the velocity when we're inputting an arrow key. Unity has a couple of input systems that you can use, and the default input system, the old input system, has a couple of ways of polling different kinds of controllers and the keyboard so that you can have multiple keybinds to the one instruction. This is called get access. In order to use this, what we want to do is create a new floating point value called x input and assign to it input.getAxis horizontal. This tells the input system that we want to access the current value of the axis called horizontal. You can do the same with y input and vertical. Let's try plugging these values into our body.velocity. You should notice that if you press the arrow keys now, the character will move. Currently our camera is quite far away, so it doesn't look like much is happening, but some movement's better than none. If we want the character to move faster, we can multiply those values by a speed factor. Let's create that now. I recommend that you also normalize this. This will make sure that going diagonal isn't any faster than going vertically or just horizontally. We can then set the velocity to direction multiplied by speed. You should notice now that nothing happens unless we set the speed value to something greater than zero. Let's make it a fun value, like five. Pretty fun. Notice how by default, the character moves whether we press W, A, S, and D or the arrow keys. This is the Unity input system working. If you'd like to set up custom keys, you can always go to Edit, Project Settings, Input Manager, and Axes. Here you can see the names of the axes we were referencing earlier, horizontal and vertical. Notice how the default bindings have arrow keys and W, A, S, and D. We also have a sensitivity value. This was creating the acceleration that we were seeing in the play mode. If we want this to go away, we can basically set our gravity and sensitivity to 1000. Now we should be moving in a way that feels essentially digital. Those of you with keen minds might be noticing that we have a little bit of an issue here. Basically, we are setting our body.velocity variable to the input on every frame. This means that we can't have any kind of inertia or momentum for the character. In order to avoid this, we can set conditions for when body.velocity is allowed to be updated, and we can split out the variables so that we only assign the axis that we intend to change. If you'd like to do that, you can add checks to see if the x or the y input is greater than zero. Notice that we use the absolute value with mathf.apps. This basically checks to see if it's true in either direction, negative or positive. At the moment, our threshold is zero, but you can change this to be something small like 0.1. Note that it will create a dead zone at the very, very center of the controller. In this version, when we've agreed that the value that we want to change the x input to is greater than zero, now we assign the speed, but only on that axis. Instead, for the y axis, we allow it to be the value that it already is. Basically, this is saying if we're pressing anything in the x direction, only update the x component of the velocity and let the y component be what it already is. We can also do that for the y axis. Now let's see how it works. Now we'll move consistently in whichever direction we like. We haven't set up any friction yet, so we're going to be moving like we're in space. There are multiple ways of doing this. If you don't want to use a script, you can simply go to the linear drag component of your rigid body and add a value. With a value of 10 for a character size of 1, this works pretty well. Note that assigning linear drag this way effectively makes it feel like the character is in a viscous fluid, no matter where they are in the game. So if we're looking to do platforming controls, you might not want to use linear drag, but instead assign your own friction on materials, or even a velocity decay variable inside of your script. If you're making a top-down 2D game, 
This should serve you pretty well. If you'd like to test out some basic collisions, you can take the player object, duplicate it, remove the script for the player movement, and then just scale the object to the size that you want. Let's give our sprite a slightly different color. Let's rename the game object wall and make a few of them. We should also set all of our walls to kinematic. Now we have very simple 2D movement in Unity. Congrats. There are some additional options to make sure that the character movement is fluid, especially when managing collisions. You can enable these for your player character by clicking continuous under collision detection and interpolate for interpolate. This will make sure that the player sprite doesn't clip through the walls on the frame that they collide with them. So that's basic movement for top-down 2D games. Now for both top-down 2D and platforming controls, we are now at a really important junction in your game development project where the scales of these values that you've started down is very important. Once you start adding graphics to the game, you might find that the players are larger or smaller than the sprites that are going to be used to render them. The size of your character and the size of your camera will make a difference in how this is perceived. So let's go set that up now. I'm going to be bringing in my character from Insignia just to give a reference for how this might affect the perception of space, size, and gravity. Very quickly for the import settings, if you're doing pixel art, just make sure that you're in point mode. If you have a sprite sheet, you can go to multiple, apply that. Now go to sprite editor and change the cell count to as many sprites as you've got. I won't be animating this today, but I'll just be taking the first frame and dragging it in. Now we have our player. If we watch him, we can see now that we're a lot further away than we thought we were, and we're moving a lot faster than we might've thought we were otherwise as well. So let's resize the collider. Let's also resize the camera. I like to use 1.8 for my cameras, which leads to a pixel height of 360 pixels. This is good for pixel art and scales nicely to 1080p and 4K. I'll go ahead and scale down the walls too. Now you can see it looks like we're moving a little too fast based on the character size. So let's scale down the speed to about three and we may want to increase linear drag if we're making a 2D game. Now we're in a reasonably good place for player movement in a top-down game but if you're looking to do platform controls, please watch on. The difference between top-down and 2D in this implementation is literally one value, gravity scale. However, you'll note that with the current implementation, gravity feels very slow. This isn't because the gravity value is too low, but because the linear drag is too high. Basically, it's like we're swimming through syrup rather than falling through the air. You'll have to remove the linear drag that we added earlier in order to make this gravity feel normal. Now the jump feels pretty reasonable. The only problem that we have is that now our deceleration is basically down to friction. The idea of friction in a platform game is really important and there are options here for how you implement it. Naturally, if you set friction on objects and materials that have uh, Unity 2D physics assigned to them, that will basically have a global effect on your game, such that friction is a force that you have to deal with. The physics system is a simulation based on reality, but in game design, we don't always want to map directly onto reality. So I'm gonna be teaching you two ways of doing friction. One that's more physics simi, and the other that's more state machine driven. So the first and most obvious thing to do is to add friction to your ground colliders. This is pretty straightforward. Just go to the colliders and add a physics material. We'll need to create a physics material first in the assets menu by going create 2D, not material, that is a shader material, but instead 2D physics material 2D. Let's call it ground for now. Here, the default friction value is 0.4. If we set this to one, that's the maximum value. Let's take our two ground colliders and give them the material. We can also create one for the player. In Unity's physics system, friction is applied by comparing the values on the two things that are colliding with each other. So having a material on the player helps set that value as well. Let's set both values to one and see what happens. Now you can see the player doesn't decelerate when they're in the air because they're not touching anything, but they do decelerate when they're on the ground. You can play around with the feeling of this friction by changing the material values, but I'd like to show you another way. Let's remove the materials from the player and from the colliders. 
Instead, we're going to be applying friction during the update. If you're not familiar with the difference between update and fixed update, you can think of it like this. Your computer will be running the game at a certain frame rate. That's the speed at which your graphics card can redraw the game. Sometimes this is capped at 60, sometimes it goes up to 120 or beyond. The fixed update, on the other hand, is closer to something like a tick rate in an online game. This is the rate at which the game updates physics objects. Neither update nor fixed update run on an actual fixed interval, but fixed update promises to run as often as it can to match an amount per second. Fixed update may run twice or even three times in a given graphics frame in order to catch up with the quota that it's got. This ensures that objects move in a generally frame independent and deterministic way. What that means is that any calculation that needs to be applied inside of the physics simulation, you generally want to do inside of fixed update. I make the exception here for inputs. So in this case, because we're setting the velocity based on the player's input, that's something that I usually reserve for the update loop because we typically want to poll input as often as we can. So here we're going to apply some friction in fixed update. Let's make it so that every fixed update, the body.velocity multiplies by 0.9. This will essentially decay the body velocity as if it had a drag. We can even expose this in the inspector and call it drag. Note that right now this behaves basically the same as the linear drag component in our physics collider. It basically makes it feel like we're always moving through fluid. But we can change that. Because we're making a platform game and we want there to be different rules depending on whether we're on the ground or in the air, we need to now make that distinction. Let's create a Boolean called grounded and only set this velocity if we're grounded. Now the friction will only be applied if we're on the ground. But how do we check when we're grounded? Let's make a new function and call it check ground. There are many, many different ways of checking to see if a character is grounded raycasts, trigger boxes, or physics overlap checks. Today, we're gonna to try to do something simple because I don't want to make it too complicated for you. <laughs> Today, we're just going to check under the player's feet to see if there is a ground collider. And to do that, the first thing we want to do is actually create a new physics layer. Unity has up to 32 different layers that you can choose from. And typically it's a good idea to have at least one player layer and one ground layer. You can then take the walls that we want to be called ground and name them ground. And now we can set both of these to ground. It's a good idea to also change the children. This will affect the colliders, which are the only ones that really matter in this instance. I should also mention that we don't really need rigid bodies on these. Um, they were just there since these used to be player objects. Let's also place the player on the player layer. And now it's time to add our collider check. So. Let's call this ground check and make it so that it just fits the very bottom of the character. Make sure that there's no gaps between the ground check and the body collider and make sure that the height is as low as you can afford to put it. Typically a pixel or two will do the job. Now we'll need to reference that collider in the code. So let's make a public box collider 2D called ground check. This is an example where it makes sense to use the inspector rather than get component because now we have multiple colliders underneath our player object. And so using get component in children would be too ambiguous. We want to have to assign things so that we know what the references are. We're going to need one more object in our script and that is a layer mask called ground mask. This lets us basically assign the different layers that we want to be considered ground. Let's check ground for now. That's a good mask. And then inside of check ground, write this line. Note that we're not really using the ground check box as a collider, more just a rectangle within which we can check if any ground collision objects exist. This lets us avoid on trigger enter and on trigger exit events and just check every frame if something exists inside of the space that the collider occupies. We also want to make sure that our ground check collider is set to a trigger so that it doesn't actually stop the player from falling through. We can check to see if this works by looking down at our grounded Boolean. Perfect. I find this solution to be fairly straightforward and avoids any weird complications with raycasts and edge cases around small platforms or the player being halfway off the level. 
It kind of reminds me of the way that games used to work. Back on the old Super Mario Brothers games, you could really make it to the very edge of a platform and still be considered grounded. That's how I like it. Now let's make this drag value a little bit more usable by creating a range and renaming it to something like ground decay. Now, when we make the value smaller, we will stop faster. Now things are feeling really sticky, but only when we're on the floor, not when we're on the ground. That's right. There are two more things that we want to do now to basically solve our platforming control mechanics. One is to not apply friction while we're moving. And two is to make it so that we can't jump infinitely. Okay. The first is to just add a threshold check to the input so that if there's any X input, we don't have the decay calculated for that frame. Perfect. We could definitely clean this up by having this check only be done once and have this variable be global. So let's do that now. This one doesn't need to be visible in the inspector. It might also be a good idea to start pushing this down into their own functions. Nice. Now let's restrict the Y movement that we were using for our top down Y into just a jump function. Here, where we set the Y velocity based on Y input, we can also just do a check for grounded. Now we can only jump if we're on the ground. Things are feeling a little bit sticky because we're not doing the Y check on our ground decay. So let's do that now. Perfect. Now the final step is to separate the speed value into ground speed and jump speed. Let's rename speed ground speed and create a new variable called jump speed. In our move with input function, we can change ground speed to jump speed. With a ground speed of something like 1.5 and a jump speed of something like 3.5, we should have a good set of variables here. Nice. If you're finding that your character can stick into walls if you push directly into them while in the air, you can add a material and set the friction to zero. Okay, there's one more thing I'll show you just because I know that everybody will want to do this, and that is having the character face the direction that we're moving in. This is really straightforward here because we're already checking whether or not we're moving on the x-axis with the input. All we have to do is set the X component of the local scale to face the direction that we want to go. What this does is creates a new local variable called direction and assigns to it the sign of the X input. So this is a number that's going to be either negative one or positive one. That's the sign, positive, negative, of the current input. So when we actually have some input, when we're moving the stick, we're going to face the direction. And all we're going to do is set the local scale so that this is either negative one or positive one. Cool. If you're looking to add some kind of acceleration to your movement, this is something that we can do by moving this line of code here back up into fixed update and turning it into an increment. We'll also need to add a max speed to stop the increment from going infinitely. Let's move our Y velocity code into a new function called handle jump. We'll still want this to be running inside of the update loop rather than the fixed update loop. Now let's take move with input and move it into fixed update. Now let's declare a float called acceleration. Let's make a new float called increment. In this, we'll place our current X input multiplied by the acceleration value. We'll also determine the new speed as the body.velocity.x plus our increment. And we can place this here. Note that if we don't place any kind of clamp on this, this will allow us to increment forever. So let's add a clamp. The clamp function makes it so that any number that you place in the first parameter cannot exceed the second or third parameter values. We want to clamp inside of the ground speed in both the negative and positive direction. That's left and right. The acceleration, ground speed, and ground decay variables now give you control over how fast you move how fast you stop, and how fast you can pivot. 
If we want the player to only be able to jump when they press the jump button, we can replace this Y input check with something like input.getButtonDownJump. By default, jump is set to the spacebar, and you can change that in the project settings. We also no longer need this Y input. Finally, we'll need to only apply friction when the body dot velocity on the Y axis is less or equal to zero. Now, holding the button down won't let us bunny hop. We have to be on the ground and pressing the spacebar. Throwing in an environment background from my game Insignia, and we get something that looks like this. Pretty good. Now, of course, we haven't got any advanced mechanics or moving cameras, but uh, we can save all of that for an advanced platforming video. When a more advanced tutorial exists, I'll put it in this playlist and uh, in the description below. Unity's physics system out of the box offers quite a lot of parameters to allow us to change the properties of our characters and have them move in predictable ways, which is great. As you want more control and more specific interactions with the character, you will have to add more scripting as I've shown you here today. So I hope you've understood the relationship between these two. Of course, not every game needs to be this complicated, but in some cases you will want even more control than what I've shown today and we'll save that for another video. I'd also like to mention, of course, that we didn't cover state machines or animators today. This will be something that we'll also cover in a later video. Okay, for now though, thank you so much for watching and I will catch you in the next one. As a bonus, let's do a quick code review to make sure that our code looks really nice and clean and that we can understand it. The first thing that I'll do is take our instance variables and group them. I feel like ground decay, ground speed, and acceleration all live in the same kind of boat. And I think jump speed lives on its own. I'd also like to take all of our object references and put them first. Nice and organized. Next, let's remove start since we're not using it. And let's change get input to check input. Get typically means that the function will return something. So since we're not actually returning anything with the check input, we're mostly just setting these global variables, it's better to write check than get. We can also make move with input more consistent by calling it handle x movement. I know that some people like to do early returns in cases like this, but I like to wrap the logic so that I can see the indentation like this. It's also arguable that you would put something like this outside of the handle X movement. The same with handle jump. So you could see the conditions inside of the update loop. But in this case, I don't think it's necessary. Finally, we can review each of the functions to see if there's anything that needs to be commented that we might not remember later. Let's maybe comment this. We could also change ground speed to max ground speed or even max X speed. Maybe we also move this into its own function. Nice. I like to use lots of modular functions that are small and reusable rather than larger functions that have lots of comments. If your functions are simple and clear, you won't need to write so many comments. I'd also like to point out that with a more complex character, we might soon want to move some of these functions out into their own scripts for checking input, for setting movement states, and for processing those states. But since we did this in one script today, I think it's okay. That's it for now. See you later.